yeah okay so we're live from now okay. amazing hello everybody hi right so welcome back to the book wanderers club uh the last last episode of this week um as you see, we have a very special guest with us today, uh, the wonderful SF Saeed, uh, author of Barjack 4 and Phoenix. So, oh, I can just hear myself on yeah. YouTube. There we go. Okay, muted. Okay. Um, right. So just uh, whilst everyone is getting online, I'm going to tweet the link in a sec, but just to give you guys a moment, because we've got a slightly different format. Uh, we're not going to do any reading through. We do have a special treat video, which we're going to show halfway through. But just while everyone's getting online, I'm going to ask... SF to just introduce himself and his book so we're all on the same page. Fantastic, thanks so much Anna. Hello everybody, um, I'm SF. Uh, perhaps some of you have come across one of my books. This is Varjak Paul, story about a cat who dreams of becoming a great warrior and learns a secret martial art that is known only to cats in his dreams. I wrote uh, another book about him, this one is called The Outlaw Varjak Paul. Uh, as you can tell from the cover, he's still a cat. Uh, he is still doing his martial arts, but his dreams of becoming a great warrior have got him in very, very big trouble because in this book, he's been declared an outlaw and he is wanted dead or alive. There is one more book I've written so far, uh, and this one is called Phoenix. As you can tell from the cover, nothing to do with cats at all. Uh, this is a whole new thing about humans and also aliens. Uh, because it's a great big space epic set across an entire galaxy. And the main characters in Phoenix are a human boy who loves the stars. His favourite thing is to look up at the sky at night, and he wishes he could go out into space, fly among the stars himself one day. And the other main character is an alien girl who he meets out there in space. So this alien girl, she is the most brilliant warrior in the whole galaxy. But what she wants to do more than anything else is to make peace between humans and aliens because there's a terrible war between them. Her family got caught right in the middle of it. So all she really wants to do is to make peace. So yeah, those are the three books I've written so far. Um, I would be delighted to talk about any and all of them and anything else you guys would like to know. So send us in your questions, but Anna, what, what, do, you, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> right, yeah, so as usual, so I say we're doing a different format, we're not doing that wildly different format. I'm gonna ask SF some questions to start with. Um, and then if you have questions, do uh, as per usual, type them into the box and we will come to those in a sec. So if you've got questions you already know, do put them in now, I'll go back through the whole list. Or if you have questions that arise as we have a chat, uh, just uh, pop them in and I'll keep track. So I guess uh, starting with Varjak Poor, because that was your first book, um, I'd love to know what the, the seed of the idea was and at what point you knew that there was a whole book in it. What a brilliant question, thank you. Um, I mean there are a couple of seeds. Uh, one of them I wrote about very recently in The Book of Hopes, the amazing anthology um, edited by Catherine Rundle, which you and I both contributed pieces to. Mine was about a cat I had when I was a kid, the naughtiest cat I have ever known. This cat appeared in my life uh, when I was 11 years old and caused absolute mayhem. He was a warrior cat. He was a true ninja cat. He would lurk behind doors and then leap out and attack you. And um, I still have scars uh, that date back to that time. So he was an extraordinary cat. Um, uh, his name was Monomy, um, but I did also have a cat much later, many years later, whose name was Varjak Paul. Uh, Varjak Paul was just a kitten when we first got him, very, very young, only a few weeks old. He was so tiny, he could actually sit in the palm of your hand. Um, he had never been outside in his entire life, very innocent little cat. I will never forget the first time he went outside because it was super dramatic. He went out into our garden and at the bottom of the garden, there was a high wall, a hundred times bigger than he was. But before we could stop him, this tiny little kitten goes right up to the wall, coils himself up like a spring and then explodes and runs all the way up the wall till he sat on the top. And you could just see him there with his eyes huge, ears trembling, <laughs> whiskers shaking in the wind because he was looking at the whole world for the first time ever. And I just thought, that's amazing. A cat goes out into the world for the first time ever. What is gonna to happen to him? I must read a story about this. I must write a story about this. And that is the seed of our Jack Paul. I really just wrote a story I wanted to read myself. And mm -hmm. I think at the heart of it, that is what every writer I know does. All writers are really just readers who take one more step and write stories they want to read themselves. So I wanted to read about a cat going out into the world, having adventures, fighting, hunting, chasing. And I, I put all of that into the book. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I, like, I think that when I get asked for writing advice, I like one of the things I always say is read something you would love, write something that you would love to read. That is exactly mine. And, and whenever people ask me for things like writing prompts, 
that is pretty much my writing prompt. So I'm probably spoiling my, my writing <laughs> But I mean, you can't go too far wrong with that prompt or that advice, I don't think. Absolutely not. Um, and whatever it is that you love, whether you think anybody else would like it or not, don't worry about that, really. It's not important whether it's a clever idea, um, a, a popular, you know, when I was writing cats doing martial arts, some of my friends thought that's never going to work. Um, but I've been lucky enough that a lot of people have now read Varjak Poor and seem to have got something out of it, which is amazing. So mm -hmm. I think if you love it, you genuinely love it and you put everything you love into it, other people will love it too. So, you know, if you would love to read a story about footballers winning the Champions League, write that story. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to read about humans and aliens, a story like Star Wars, you should write this book, except mm -hmm. I did already. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we are going to we are going to get onto things, but I did want to just uh, think about Varjak Four. I think um, having cats as your I mean I don't know whether this is an animal question or a cat specific question, but for you okay. as a, a writer, what are the kind of exciting bits and what are the challenging bits about having an animal or a cat specifically as your your protagonist? Yeah, that is a really interesting question. I think um, cats. I I love cats, obviously. I think if I could be any animal, I would be a cat. I think perhaps secretly I am a cat who was <laughs> accidentally born into a human body, still hasn't quite got used to it. Um, but yeah, I think the world as it really is to a cat is very, very different to the world as it is to us. Their senses are so different to us. They can hear so much more. Um, they can feel tiny vibrations in air currents in their whiskers and their fur. You know, they, they can see in the dark, you know, they, they live in a very different world in a way. So to try and imagine the world as it really would be to a cat was a big challenge in writing Varjak Paul. And well, I did a lot of research by watching my own cat and his adventures, um, but I did also read books like this, um, Cat Watching by Desmond Morris. An amazing, no, really an amazing book. This answers questions I never knew the answers to. Like, what does it mean, you know, when a cat's tail flicks in a certain way? You know, all that kind of body language, purring, not necessarily what you think it is. So if you are interested in cats and cat behavior, I can really recommend this book. Uh, I put lots of it into Varjak Paul and uh, even more actually into the outlaw Varjak Paul. I think this is a, a catier book altogether. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I put I put uh, even more research. I could pull down. There's a whole shelf over there of cat research books, which you can't see. Thank goodness. But um, yeah, so there are definitely challenges. But as for what are the advantages, I think writing about animals is just an incredibly powerful thing. The, many of the oldest stories we know are animal stories. The oldest art we know is art about animals or the sort of boundaries between human and animal where humans shade into animals, animals shade into humans. Those cave paintings you see on the walls of the most ancient caves, the oldest art humanity has produced, it's all about animals, isn't it? So I don't know why that is, but I do know there is something very, very powerful about animals. Mm -hmm. I think animals can help us to think about things that it can be difficult to think about directly as mm -hmm. humans. So mm -hmm. in Valjak, Paul, a kitten, very small, goes out into a very big world. I think that's something we can probably all relate to. I've certainly felt that many times in my life, being very small, surrounded by things I don't know how to deal with. Mm -hmm. And I think if I were to write about that directly, it might be a bit too much, you know, it might be a bit heavy. But when I say to you, a kitten has to climb, you can get that immediately, can't you? And it, it kind of, I think that might be one reason why Barjack Paul works for some readers, you know, that I should also say, if you don't like cats, don't worry. It's all right. There are other animals in the book too. <laughs> and um, if you like dogs, well, um, it turns out in a book about cats, many people's favorite characters are the dogs. So uh, <laughs> I do like dogs too. I think dogs are awesome. Just want to put a plug there for dogs. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of sort of small things in very, very big spaces, Phoenix yeah. obviously is set in space, which honestly, genuinely space terrifies me because of that, like, vastness of it um and I guess it's kind of the same question in that like because I feel like writing in space again must put such limits on things you can do whilst also kind of opening up this huge other possibility and the kind of clash of those two things is maybe what makes it an exciting place to write about to me it's all about the possibility it's all about the openness I I 
I don't know why I don't find it scary. I, I know some people do. I mean, I, I grew up in the middle of London, so so much pollution, light pollution at night. We never really see the night sky clearly, do we? And uh, but I remember going camping uh, in the deserts in Jordan with my dad when I was about, I think, 12 years old. Um, my family is originally from the Middle East. My dad was still living in Jordan. So he took me on this incredible camping trip to Wadi Rum, uh, where the night sky is so dark and so clear. You can see the whole universe. It's unbelievable. It is like one of those pictures taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. I couldn't sleep all night just looking up at this living sky, millions and millions of stars, galaxies. I just thought the universe is amazing. It's, there's so much. How many other worlds are there? How many other forms of life could be looking back at me right now? And what would happen if we ever met them? If humans ever met aliens, could we be friends with them? Would we treat them as horribly as we've treated all the other life on this planet? Who knows, you know, but I think these are big, important questions and they have stayed with me all my life. Um, the more we find out about the universe, the more amazing it seems. So things that I thought were stars back then, we now know those are galaxies and each one contains billions of stars. There are billions and billions of galaxies. Each one has billions and billions of stars. It's unbelievable. And it turns out that many of the atoms that make up you and me uh, and everything originated in the heart of a star. Isn't that extraordinary? When stars die, they go supernova and they create the atoms that make up new life elsewhere in the universe. So we are all made of stardust. That literally is an incredible thing. Uh, and the things that have been you have been other things in the past and will be other things again. So the universe is apparently an endless cycle of life, death, rebirth, rather like the ancient myth of the phoenix. Mythology knew this stuff thousands of years before astrophysics. And I guess in this book, I wanted to bring together ancient mythology um, with the most cutting edge science of space and the stars. There are some characters in Phoenix called the 12 Astraeus. The aliens believe the stars are alive. Sometimes they come down from the sky and walk among us. When they do, we're dazzled and we call them gods but really they believe all the gods in all the old mythologies are really stars who come again and again and again. There's the Astraeus of love. She's the origin of Aphrodite, Ishtar, Bastet, all these characters. So um, I wanted to bring those things together, mythology and science, just to try and answer those questions that have been with me all my life. Like, what is the universe? What is this? What does it mean that we are alive and conscious in it? Isn't that incredible, you know? And how should we live knowing that, knowing that we're all made of the same stuff, we're all connected in the most fundamental way. What does that mean for how we should live with each other? So I wanted to put all of that into Phoenix. The downside of that is as limitless as the universe is, uh, the book ended up being rather limitless too, taking me seven years to write. So it was a bit of an epic, but it was worth it in the end because it is the book I wanted to read myself. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. And we've got a little glimpse of a Dave McKean's illustrations uh, in that, which leads us nicely into the video. But before I show uh, the video, or before I show the video, <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask you a bit about, because uh, he has illustrated all three of your books, I believe. That's right. um, and I just wanted to know about like the process of how do you work together? Do you, how you communicate, how, how that works? Oh, great question. So Dave McKean is, is really one of my heroes. Um, I was reading the comics that he used to make in the 1990s with writers like Neil Gaiman. Um, and I was just a fan, really. I just I just love the way he draws stuff, you know. Um, when I finished the 17th and final draft of Varjak Paul, and my editor finally said, oh, very good, SF. Now, who do you think draws cats well? <laughs> but my first and only thought was Dave McKean. Dave McKean had recently done a comic called Cages, in which a cat goes up and down a fire escape looking into people's flats and their lives. I thought it was the best cat I'd ever seen and probably the best city as well. So I said, oh, Dave McKean, he does the best cats, but he won't want to do my book, I'm nobody. My publisher to his everlasting credit said, no, no, we will send it to him. And the worst that can happen is he says no. So he sent Val Jack Paul to Dave, uh, who read it with his daughter, who was at school at the time, and their cat, who by complete coincidence was a silver blue cat. Ah, serendipity. So yeah, amazing thing. So he then wrote back and said, yes, I would like to draw some cats for you. So I got to work with one of my heroes. It was unbelievable. The first time we worked together, I don't, I, didn't, I just gave him the words, you know, and it came back entirely illustrated. So in the book, in Valjack Paul, while things are happening in the real world, um, you know, there's illustrations and text. And then when Valjack dreams, 
he goes into the ancient land of Mesopotamia where his ancestor teaches him the secret martial art. And at that point, the illustrations come in a soft wash behind the text. All of this, and then it comes back into reality again in the hard black and white. All of that's Dave, I contributed nothing. Yeah. That's just a genius, you know. Yeah. Um, so I'm so lucky to work with somebody like that. By the time we were working on Phoenix, we'd kind of become friends, collaborators. We'd been trying to make a Varjak Paul movie, which we're still trying to make. I'll tell you more if anyone wants to know. But uh, yeah, when I was writing Phoenix, I was saying I'm doing this sci-fi space epic, aliens, gods. Do you think you can draw all the ancient gods as imagined by aliens in the future as stars? And he was, oh yes, I, I'd love to do that. And incredibly he did. So um, yeah, that was a collaboration. I designed those sequences I've just showed you um, for Dave to illustrate because they tell parts of the story in a way that I think is more powerful than ordinary prose. So this um, video we're just gonna show you now, this is the book trailer he made for Phoenix. Um, it's literally chapter one. It's the beginning of the book that he's animated and brought to life using his own illustrations from the book. And it's just the beginning of the story. Okay, right, here we go. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen and I have the video on it, so. Okay, Good. can you see that? I can, yes. Okay, great, that bodes well, here we go, okay. <laughs> Lucky dreamed of the stars again that night. He loved the stars and dreamed about them most nights. A million points of silver light shining in the black. But this dream was different. This time the stars were calling him. They were trying to tell him something. They were making a small, soft, silvery sound, like the chime of a faraway bell. The sound grew. It surged and swelled, rising up into the sky. Like his blood surged with it. His feet lifted off from the floor. And in his dream, Bucky flew. He rose up and soared through space into the stars and constellations. He rose higher and higher until the sound wasn't distant anymore. It was all around him now, surrounding him with waves of overwhelming power, though he still couldn't grasp its meaning. If he could just get a little nearer. He reached out his hands to touch the stars. was in his bedroom, in his mother's apartment, back on Phoenix. A headache dropped behind his eyes. Then he saw his sheets. The top sheet on the bed was burned. There was a massive hole through the middle of it. All around it, the white linen had gone black, crumbled into ash. Right, I hope you all could see that because it's so beautifully done. What a, what an amazing thing to have. I think it's extraordinary. I've shown that in hundreds and hundreds of schools around the country and it never fails to mesmerize people. I've now watched it thousands of times and I can't stop watching it. I think it's amazing. But that is literally the beginning of the book. That is chapter one. Lucky, the human boy, literally dreaming of the stars and then waking up to find his sheets are burned. What is going on? Something very, very strange. If you read the book, you will cross the galaxy with him. Uh, you will meet the alien girl who I mentioned at the beginning, who's the most brilliant warrior in the galaxy, but just wants to make peace between humans and aliens. And as they travel together, get to know each other, this human boy and alien girl discover that humans and aliens have way more in common than they ever realized. And maybe together they can even save the galaxy. So that is a small introduction to Phoenix. Amazing. Right, I uh, want to make sure that we have time to uh, ask, answer, ask, ask, answer questions that are coming online. But I have a couple of uh, sort of book wandery themed, reading themed <laughs> questions, um, which actually to start with, I did, and, and also just to say to everyone watching, we might run over a little bit. SF has kindly said that we can have a little bit more of his time to make sure we get through some more questions. I, I, I love talking to readers. So if you guys have questions, ask us questions. I, I love talking to readers. Amazing. You're a real kind of champion for the importance of children's books. And I would just love for you to kind of tell people watching why you kind of feel children's books are so vital. Ah, uh, well, how long have we got? <laughs> I, I believe the books we love when we are young are the most important books of all. 
They are the ones that shape us, make us who we are, stay with us forever. They shape our whole experience and perception of the world, what we think is possible in it. They help us to understand our own experiences and other people's experiences. They open windows. They are mirrors and windows and sliding doors uh, in a famous phrase. Uh, this book my mum gave to me when I was eight years old, Watership Down by Richard Adams. Same copy, you can see how battered the poor thing is. Uh, and perhaps you can even see that it once cost 50p. Anyway, that's how old I am. So Watership Down, <laughs> I read when I was eight years old. I thought it was amazing. Uh, epic adventure story about rabbits trying to survive in the wild. Could not stop reading that book. As I read it, I thought this is the best book ever. If I could ever write anything nearly as good as this, that would be an amazing thing to do with my life. And I believe my life changed forever at that moment because ever since then, that is what I wanted to do. I reread Watership Down for the first time when I was 35, just after I had finished writing Bar Jack Paul. Um, I was actually going to interview Richard Adams for an article I was writing for a newspaper. And as I reread that book, I was stunned by just how much of it I could see in myself and in Varjak Paul. Varjak really would not exist without Watership Down. In fact, in a kind of embarrassing way, I almost rewrote Watership Down, but with a cat rather than rabbit. Um, but I think it's stunning. I think if you go and look back at your favorite childhood books now, just to see how deep these things live inside us. I don't think anything else in our lives is like that. And the, the physical objects themselves are a really important part of that. So I always encourage children, if you love a book now, hold on to it. Don't let it go. Mm -hmm. Read it again in five years, 10 years, 20 years. See what happens. You will find the book appears different each time you read it. Of course, it's not. It is the same thing. You are the thing that is different. So the book tells you so much about yourself. It's actually a part of yourself that is outside you, that, that keeps your memories of who you were. So when people sometimes ask me, what is this all around you, SF? The first thing I say, well, th this is the contents of my head. This is what the inside of me looks like. Um, that's a joke, but it is also true because I, I think the books that you read and you love do shape who you are on the inside. Um, so yeah, I think it's uh, sad to see people sometimes underestimating, sometimes patronizing, looking down, dismissing and ignoring children's literature, sometimes even saying, I've seen this horrendous statement that's not really literature, these books aren't proper books. I've been asked, are you ever gonna write a real book? I don't think there's any kind of book realer than this. This is a book for everyone. You can read this at any age. That is not true of the kind of thing that wins the Booker Prize, is it? I think these things are greater. They are richer, deeper, uh, more powerful and resonant. They are modern myths in a way. That's where mythology lives now, children's literature. So yeah, I'm sorry if I've ranted a little bit, but you did ask me my uh, most exciting question. Yes. It's my favourite thing to hear rants about, so <laughs> I don't mind. And it's, I, I, I've been rereading quite a lot of my old favourites at the moment. I found that like on lockdown in particular, I've really mm. wanted to go back to that. And it's interesting, isn't it? Like we said about Watership Down, I've just reread. And I know that you've just, I believe you discovered Diana Wynne-Jones relatively recently, but I just have been rereading a lot of her books who I, I always say, if, if forced to say she's my all time favourite author. And mm -hmm. it's really made me realise, I think it's probably the first time I've reread them since I have written books. Okay. And it really has made me realise how much she had a huge impact on me as a writer um I knew she had an impact on me as a reader but there's you could just I yeah they're not the same stories but there's just she's yeah. rooted so her stories are rooted so deeply in me yeah yeah and what I love about this is that we're all passing it on Diana Wynne Jones has passed it on to you without even knowing that you're now passing it on to other people in like 20 years time there are going to be writers who said oh I read Pages and Co when I was at primary school and that made me want to be a writer. Do you know what I mean? It's an amazing thing. When I got to meet Richard Adams and I told him, you know, your book meant so much to me. I I've ended up writing one. Uh, he was, oh, I should love to read it. I thought he was just being polite. I don't think he meant it, but so I sent him a copy of Bar Jack Paul and he sent me the most amazing letter where he actually used the word brilliant. Most moving thing ever. But yeah, I feel like stories are the things here in a way more than writers. Stories have this weird way of, replicating themselves, passing themselves on in different forms. So you're not writing Diana Wynne Jones, I'm not really writing Richard Adams, we're us, but mm -hmm. they are part of us and we then become part of other people, I hope. There are people I'm hearing now, so Varjak Paul was originally published a long time ago and there are people who read this 
at school who are adults, even primary school teachers themselves now, who are passing the books on in schools themselves. Uh, I think that's amazing. That is so moving to see that um, there is this great chain of stories that links us all, all the way back to those first stories we were talking about. People sitting around in caves, telling each other animal tales. Here we are still doing it. I think we'll still be doing it on space stations in the future. So we are all connected by stories. I love that. That's magic. It is. It is. It's, it is magic, isn't it? Um, right. I am uh, aware that uh, we want to get some questions in. Although I haven't asked my, uh, I haven't asked my book wandering question, which is: if you could travel inside one of your own books, which scene would you go to? I maybe should have told you in advance. I know this is a big question. Or what? Just one of the scenes. What's one that comes to mind? Can we come back to that? Maybe take of a few course, questions from. I'll have okay, a think. I'll have a think. Right. Let's get through some of these questions. So you kind of talked about this a little bit, um, but Sophie, I want to know which room you were in because she likes that you have lots of books. Thank you, Sophie. Um, yes, yes, I have lots of books. You can't actually see half of them, but you can see quite a lot of them. This is my study. Uh, this is where I'm writing my new book, Tiger, at the moment. I uh, don't normally write here. Normally I go to my local public library. I love libraries. I think they're amazing, wonderful places. I go to my local public library, work on my books. Um, but obviously right now you can't do that. So I'm working in my study and these are some of my books. Okay. Amazing. Okay, I've got two questions from two different people that are kind of linked. Okay. So um, I'm going to ask you them both at the same time. So you can kind of, I think you probably answer them in a similar way. So Marianne had asked, um, which of your stories as in the Varjak Poor books or Phoenix, did you enjoy writing the most? And then Mia has asked, which was the hardest to write? Marianne and Mia. That's <laughs> very interesting. Um, it's very hard, very, very hard to talk about this, you know, because each book is different. Varjak Poor definitely means something to me. That nothing else ever will. Before I wrote this book, I did attempt to write other books and they were all rejected by everybody I sent them to. I had about 90 rejections in total before Barjack Paul was published. Uh, so when this object became a real thing, it was unbelievable and incredible. I don't think anything else in my life will ever mean uh, anything like that again. The Outlaw Varjack Poor is the book I've managed to do quickest. Uh, this one took only three years, which is a record for me. So I feel very proud of that. Um, Phoenix, I think the hardest so far, for sure. Uh, the scale is so much bigger. Don't get me wrong, I would not change anything in Varjack, but it is quite a small story. It's a cat in the back streets and alleys of one city. Uh, Phoenix, it's a whole galaxy. The, the, the book contains stars, supernovas, black holes, uh, you know, gods coming down from it. It's the biggest stuff I can imagine. At the end of the story, not to spoil it for anybody, um, the characters are facing the end of all worlds, not just the end of the world, all worlds. So it is the biggest stuff I can imagine. And that is hard. So Phoenix has been the hardest so far. Having said that, I have been working on this new book, Tiger, for some time now. And I think I'm enjoying this one more than I've enjoyed writing before. It's not quicker. <laughs> I'm now seven years and three months into it, so setting a new record of a rather unwanted kind, but uh, I feel it, it will be worth it in the end. Yeah, for sure. Also, I've, I'm scrolling through, we've got a lot of people who are asking questions, but it's just I want to pass on, there's a lot of people just saying how much that they enjoy the books and people saying how much they enjoyed watching the trailer as well. Oh, um, thank you so much. Uh, right, so uh, Karen would like to know what you're writing at the moment, which you kind of just, you kind of, uh, you mentioned Tiger, but maybe for people who aren't so familiar, could you tell us yeah, yeah, I'll a, tell bit a bit about more. that? Yeah, of course. So Tiger is T-Y-G-E-R, uh, inspired by my favourite poem. Uh, some of you guys might know the William Blake poem that begins, Tiger, Tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. An amazing poem uh, about a tiger and many other things too, including I think the idea of infinity. Blake was very interested in the idea of infinity, so am I. And particularly the idea we now have in science that there may be an infinite number of parallel worlds. The world as we know it, not the only version of the world that exists. And history could go differently in every world. Every world is different and therefore you might be different in every world. I love that. I think that's one of the most fascinating and inspiring ideas ever. Uh, and some of my own favourite books have done something with it. So Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials, which I absolutely love, all about parallel worlds. Mallory Blackman's Noughts and Crosses books, again, imagining alternate histories. Uh, so Tiger is my attempt to sort of do one of those. I started writing a thing called Tiger, set in a parallel world. 
seven years and three months ago. Um, after two and a half years, I thought this is good, but this is really book two in a sequence. Oh dear, I had to put aside book two and write book one. Um, so that is what I've been doing for the last four years and eight months or something like that. Uh, I just got notes on draft 14 from my editor yesterday and uh yeah so draft 15 of tiger began today uh mm -hmm. so uh, for the record just starting draft 15 of tiger it's getting closer still not quite there yet i think my aim with every book is to make it the very 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 best i can possibly make it i never want to look back at my books and think oh i wish i could change that because you can't that's it it's done you can never change it again and whenever I buy a book myself as a reader or borrow a book from the library or a friend, what am I hoping? I think I'm secretly hoping this is going to be my new favourite. This is going to be the new Watership Down, the new Star Wars. What, whatever you love, I think that's what you want too, isn't it? If you're a Harry Potter fan, you want this new book to be as good as Harry Potter. And if it is not, if the thing you're reading is not as good as that, I think you have to go through it again and again, as many times as it takes, until the thing you are reading is so utterly brilliant, you really cannot see any possible way that you could make it better. Yeah. That is how I've written the three books I've written so far. That is why they took so long. Um, uh, and that is what I have to do with Tiger. I, I wish it could be quicker. Yeah. I would love to be um, Jacqueline Wilson. If I could be any other author, I would be Jacqueline Wilson. I love her. She's amazing, over a hundred books. She does two a year sometimes. I'm not, I'm me, I'm slow, I'm not very good, it takes me years. But what I do know is if I keep going in the end, I get something I feel pretty good about and then it turns out other people can enjoy it too. So yeah, Tiger, I would like to think we'll be done with it this year, but it takes as long as it takes to make a book as good as you possibly can. So I would just ask anybody who's waiting for Tiger, please be patient. I'm doing my best yeah. every day. It yeah. will be it will be there soon. Soon could be on a geological or even astral <laughs> scale, but it will happen. So <laughs> also, I love um, what you said, because my it's not story, my sort of essay in the Book of Hopes is called The Magical Thing About Reading. And it's literally about the, that split second when you start a new book and that every book you read, just that moment where any, the next book could be your new favorite. That's literally what I wrote about for the Book of Hope. So I love that you mentioned that. It's my favorite, it's like my favorite feeling that second way, like this could be my new favorite book. Magical. And it's always a possibility, isn't it? Books are this sort of field of quantum possibility. Uh, and yeah, I, I love that moment too. I have to admit, uh, it's a horrible thing to say, but in 99% of cases, the further on I go in the book, the less I feel like that. I often feel, oh, I wish they'd done a bit more with this idea. What a brilliant idea. Why didn't they do more with it? Or that character would never say that. Or, you know, that doesn't make sense. Do you know what I mean? Like a lot of books, I think, let, let me down. You know, as a reader, I've maybe become a very grumpy reader because of the way I'm forced to write. Sometimes I read a book where I'm just, I just love this. I really enjoy reading this. I did recently read this book called Pages and Co, which I enjoyed very much indeed. That just swept me along and that was lovely to read. But as I was reading it, I was thinking as a writer, this person has put in some work here. This didn't just come out looking like this. So uh, thank you for doing that work. Oh, well, that's very kind of you to read it and to say so. I also should say that my editor really does a lot of work with me because I am constantly, uh, yes, no, editors are magical beings. And uh, as a writer, you um, your relationship with your editor has a huge impact on, I think, how your books come out and how much you kind of love writing and working on them. And I'm very fortunate to have always worked with editors that I've, I've loved working with and have been, yeah, I, I feel editors like I always need to give them so much credit. <laughs> no, no, they're crucial. So my editor, David Fickling, and now Rosie Fickling, uh, at David Fickling Books. David Fickling is a legend. So he edited Philip Pullman. You know, he's the person who edited his Dark Materials, Northern Lights, Subtle Knife. He um, edited Jacqueline Wilson's breakthrough book, The Story of Tracy Beaker. I'm sure many of you guys know that, or watch the TV adaptation. She credits him with helping her to find her voice as a writer. You know, many, many other great authors he's worked with, you know. So I feel very lucky to work with him. Every time he says to me, yes, now I think you should do some more drafts, SF. I, my heart breaks, as perhaps yours does if your teacher is saying to you, I think you could improve this piece of writing by doing it again. But 
they're not saying it to be mean. They're saying it because writing is hard. No one can get it all right in one go or even two goes necessarily. Jacqueline Wilson did tell me, incidentally, she does two or three drafts of each book, which is incredible. The rest of us do more. Uh, <laughs> not everyone has to do 17 like me. But uh, but yeah, so I, I, I when David Fickling originally offered to publish Vile Jackpool, I think it was the 11th draft um, that he had read. I made a big uh, blog recently for the British Library where I show you pages from all these drafts. Mm. I can send you a link if you like. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I can pop that. If, uh, I'll pop really? that in the description box so people, I'll have to do it after we finish, but we'll get oh, all right. the information with everything we've talked about. I'll make sure it's in the description box. That was awesome. That's fab fascinating. So the 11th draft I thought was in great shape and many other people had enjoyed it. And he said, yes, I would love to publish this and I'd love you to do some more drafts. I couldn't believe it. I thought, I, I think I hate this person, but he was the only publisher who had ever said yes. So I just said, okay, I'll do some more drafts then. And he turned out to be right. And every time he says it to me, my first reaction is I, I really do hate this person. But the truth is I actually love him deeply because he helps me go further than I could help go on my own. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you do need someone else to just help you see how it looks to someone who isn't you. You've yeah. put all of yourself into it and it's really hard for you to see what is actually on the page and what isn't, what is actually happening in someone else's head when they're reading it. Um, you know, the, the great secret about books, they are made by readers as much as writers. Like when readers are reading, it's actually happening in their heads. Your job is long in the past. So your job as a writer is essentially to get out of the way and enable readers to make that magic for themselves. So my editor's notes to me are often on the order of this, uh, cut, take things out, you know, um, and, what can I say? It does seem to work. If I hang in there long enough, it works in the end. Yeah, and that's all that matters, really. In the end, the end product is all anybody remembers. No one cares how long it took. Uh, all they care about was, did they love it when they were reading it? And I've been lucky enough to hear from people who have enjoyed my books. And if you ever say that to an author, I read your book, I really enjoyed it. It makes it all worthwhile. Absolutely. Seven years, no problem. I'd spend 10. I yeah. hope I haven't just cursed myself to doing that. It's like... <laughs> Right, let's wait, let's try and squeeze a few more in. So George asked, um, who inspired you to write and why? I think um, all the stories I loved myself, particularly when I was young, have inspired me to write. So I've talked about Watership Down. I mentioned Star Wars, seeing the first Star Wars film uh, when I was 11 was another life changing moment for me. Um, as that first starship went over the screen, I just thought, this is what I've been waiting for all my life. That is the film they now call Episode 4, A New Hope. But back then was just called Star Wars because there were no episodes before it, George Lucas. And uh, Star Wars, the thrill of seeing Star Wars is another thing that made me want to write stories myself. So I think the stuff you love, that is what will inspire you the most. Mm -hmm. um, right, uh, Jenny has asked, how many languages has Vardak Poor been translated in? I know it's been translated into Finnish because that's the language that she reads it in. Oh, Jenny, that is so amazing. Um, yeah, I think it's called Varja Kapala in Finnish. I'm, my pronunciation is probably awful, but yeah, it has been translated. Into, I think it's maybe 14 or 15 now, something like that. So quite quite a few. Um, it's, it's kind of an extraordinary thing to see a book go around the world. Uh, and sometimes I hear from readers, well, I have heard from some readers in Finland, so I do know I have some there. So hello to everyone in Finland. That is so awesome. Um, but yeah, German, French, um, you know, but then also things like uh, Thai. Um, uh, right now, there's um, someone, two people interested in doing an Arabic translation, which I'm super excited about because my family is originally from the Middle East. So I would love there to be a Arabic translation of Varjak Paul. Uh, but if anyone is watching this anywhere in the world and would like to translate my book into a language that it isn't already in, I'm totally up for it. Get in touch yeah. with the agent. It's one of the coolest things getting your book in a language. And I think oh, like- I've, I've got to show you something. Yeah. <laughs> As we had that question. So German Varjak Paul, Tito Stats. Japanese Varjak Paul. I don't oh. know how you pronounce that, but anyway. Um, seeing those things is is extraordinary and and really kind of kind of wonderful so yeah, yeah. do we have any any uh, any more questions or things, things we've got one well we've got two more one that i think i'm just gonna ask just to make so daniel just in case he has sort of missed the first because daniel had asked how many books he'd written which we kind of but just to 
uh, recap on that, it's three. Three books so far. So I wrote two books before Large Act Paul that nobody published and uh, were rejected by everyone in the world. I now look back on those, they're not books. They're really just first drafts. I didn't really know about drafts yet. So I don't count them as books. And I've been working on two different books of Tiger for the last seven years and three months, but they're not books either, they're, they're drafts. So, um, so it's really only three, but I don't think that means that work doesn't count. I think it's all part of being a writer. I remember when I was at school, I did not feel ready to write a whole novel yet, but I was always writing short stories. And I remember once getting all my best stories, copying them into one exercise book in my neatest handwriting, photocopying this in the library, and then trying to sell this thing to people as my first book. Managed to sell one copy to my mum. So not a very successful first book, but I do think that shows, um, not even a book in fact, but I think that shows that you, you can write at any age. Actually age has nothing to do with it. All readers can be writers. A writer is just someone who takes one more step, writes stories they want to read themselves. So I've only published three books so far, but there are many others that I have worked on and in a way they're all part of my being a writer. So I wouldn't dismiss the work, it's all been part of it. And whatever stories you are writing now, they all count, they're all writing, you know, mm -hmm. even if they're not published books. And if you're interested in getting books published, you'll probably have to go through something like that. You know, there may be rejections and setbacks, persevere, hang in there. I don't think anybody gets published on their first go either. Again, it's not something we all talk about, uh, but it is something that happens to everybody. So even JK Rowling had rejections, you know, it, it's, it's inevitable, it's how life is. Um, you know, you have to work to get better, but if you do, there is nothing more worthwhile and rewarding. Yeah. I feel now when I look at the three books I've managed to publish in, what is it, nearly 20 years now, I feel, well, there's nothing else I would rather have done with that time. Yeah. Uh, it was hard, it was long, but there is nothing else I would rather have done. So uh, yeah, only three, but I feel I did my best with all of them. Yeah. Um, right, okay, I am aware that we don't wanna go on too long. So I've got one last question to say. So Jess, um, this is, before that, Jess had asked about writing tips, but I hope, Jess, that you feel like you've picked up, I think as part of the conversation, there's Thanks been so. lots of writing tips. I hope you feel that you've picked up some excellent writing tips. We're gonna just- Get finish your writing. <laughs> Sharon has asked if the, uh, you write for a set number of hours every day. Oh, Sharon, that's a great question. Actually, I do quite like having a structure. I find that very helpful. I think if you rely on inspiration to strike, maybe it'll happen once, but it's probably not gonna happen every day. Um, so yeah, I, I do show, well, my normally, my normal routine is to show up at the local library at nine in the morning when they open the doors and I work till lunchtime on my new book. So three or four hours, then I go and have lunch, have a break, and then maybe come back in the afternoon and do another two or three hours then. I feel if I can get five or six hours of actual writing done in a day, that's a good day's work. You know, I can't do much more than that in a day. Um, Having said that, all the time I'm not at the desk working, it's somewhere in the back of my mind. Sometimes the best things have come to me at four in the morning. I just wake up and think, ah, well, obviously, if this, then that, then that, and that's how that works. And I have to run downstairs and make a frantic note in my notebook. But obviously, often those are the really big breakthroughs. And they are obviously writing too, but it's not happening to a schedule or a structure. I don't count it as part of my six or seven hours. But I think if I do, the structured work every day, that inspiration happens much more. So you have to show up and do the work and then the other stuff, the magic just begins to happen. If you yeah. just wait for the magic without doing the work, probably not gonna happen. Yeah, that's excellent advice. That's another writing tip as well. Yeah. Um, right, okay, let's, I think it's probably time that we need to uh, wrap up. Um, thank you so much everyone who's been commenting and questions. I think we've asked most of the questions. Fantastic. Um, uh, right, we're going to finish as usual, though, uh, with a quick uh, a bookshop recommendation and a writing prompt. Um, right. So to start with, yes, could you just tell us uh, about uh, a favourite bookshop? Yes, I'll tell you about two bookshops. There's one in London called Burley Fisher Books. Fantastic bookshop. They are sending books out. If you would like to order a book from them online, um, they will send you a book today. Uh, so Burley Fisher Books are brilliant. I also want to give a big shout out to Kenilworth Books in the Midlands. They are fantastic booksellers. Um, and I, I have a particular affection for them because um, when they read Phoenix, um, 
They liked it so much, they sent a copy to Donald Trump because they felt it was a book he needed to read. And I thought that was kind of the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. Uh, uh, so yeah, Kenilworth Books in the Midlands, brilliant booksellers. Um, I, I, could, I could spend the whole hour of just course, telling you about course. my favorite bookshops, but I'll stop there. No, that's good too. And I'll put, uh, I'll put all the information about those in the description box as well. Um, alongside, because some people are asking, I will put details of where you can find SF online and where you can find information about the books. I'll put all, anything we've talked about, I'll put links and information in the description box. Give me a sec after we've gone offline and I'll get that all up, like, up ready for you to have a look at. Um, so we're just going to finish though with hopefully you found this chat uh, as inspiring as I have um, and you want to go and do some of your own writing. Uh, so SF, what is your uh, writing prompt? You've given us a bit of a clue, I think, earlier. Here's my writing prompt. Forget about writing. Don't even think about writing. Think about reading or think about movies if you like movies or TV or comics, whatever you like a story to be. If you could have any story, what would it be? And I mean literally anything. What do you secretly in your heart of hearts most want to read a story about? Now I want you to shamelessly sit down and write that thing yourself. Whatever it is, whether you think anyone else would like it or not, write that thing yourself. Put everything you love into it and just enjoy it. That is my writing prompt. No stress, just go for it and have fun. Amazing. That is excellent. And another excellent writing tip, really, all wrapped up in one. Right. We uh, have gone over um, a little bit, uh, but thank you to SF for giving us a bit of his time. And thank you so much for all of your questions. So we've had so much um, to talk about. I will be back. Uh, next week actually on Monday the guest is Catherine Rundell talking about the Book of Hopes um, so uh, do tune in to hear all about that project and then we have Kieran Millwood Hargrave on Wednesday and um, on Friday due to this feels very nepotistic but due to requests we're going to have a Pages and Co one on Friday uh, because some of you've been asking you want to ask questions about Pages and Co so thank you for those if you've been asking we're going to do that next Friday. Um, as I've said all the information about everything is going to be in the description box within about five ten minutes of this finishing but the biggest thank you of all is to SF for uh, giving us his time sharing his ideas and his uh, inspiration. I've absolutely loved uh, hearing about uh, everything that you kind of put into your book. So thank you so much. Well, a big thank you to everyone who's tuned in, listened, watched, asked questions. Uh, and a huge thank you to you, Anna, for doing this. I think it's a wonderful thing you're doing here, spreading the love of reading and books, inspiring uh, readers and writers around the world. I think it's brilliant. So thank you. Oh, someone just, people just reminded me, we never got back to the book wandering question. If you could go inside one of your books, where would you go? I'm being reminded. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll do my best. So I have been thinking about this. Um, one scene I don't want to go into is this, where Varjak is nearly run over by a car um, because he's trying to talk to it for reasons that will become apparent if you read the book. I don't want to go into this scene where he meets Sally Bones, the thin white cat with one ice blue eye, boss of the meanest gang of street cats in the city. However, I think I might quite like to go into this scene where he meets his ancestor, the legendary Jalal the Poor, who shows him the secret martial art for cats in his dreams. I would quite like to learn something like that in my dreams. I think that would be amazing. That's a great answer. Thank you for reminding me and thank you for thinking about it. Right. OK, we definitely run out of time now. So I will see everybody next week. Have a lovely weekend and thank you again to SF. Thanks, everybody. Right.